Hi, everyone. Um, speakers, please feel free to take to the stage. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I know that it is super hot outside and one of those days where you probably didn't feel like moving anywhere. So I'm really, really grateful for you all coming to this conversation, which I can guarantee is going to be super interesting and insightful. We've got an amazing panel um, and I can't wait to hear what they have to say. I know we've got a lot of different perspectives and angles to address. Um, so I'm going to hand straight over to the wonderful Veronica, who's going to be leading the discussion. Um, and yeah, enjoy. Hello, thanks for joining me on this warm and sultry evening. Uh, my name's Veronica Kandapar. I'm an assistant editor at the Financial Times. Um, uh, my, my usual job is looking over um, overseeing video and audio journalism. Um, also part of my job, my, the strategic part of my job, is looking after diversity and inclusion in the newsroom. Um, my DNI job is quite unusual in that I'm not a DNI expert and I'm not an HR expert. I'm a newsroom expert. And so I'm specifically looking at ways in which to make our newsroom more inclusive and to make sure that the culture of our newsroom can bring the best out in everybody that comes into it. So that meant that I had quite a sudden introduction to the world of DNI. The Financial Times, as you probably all know, is a very data-driven organization. So when I took on the DNI brief, the first thing I wanted to do was to have a look at the data. Um, we're a small community in editorials, there's only about 600 of us, but we are scattered across the world, so you don't necessarily know what everybody looks like, so you can't guess at the levels of diversity necessarily. And I was quite surprised at how difficult it is to understand your own community in numbers. And so that's my interest in this topic, and that's why the conduitors invited um, me along to be involved in this conversation. But I have with me some actual experts. So um, right next to me, we have Hepsi Pemberton, who is an author and investor and works in the DNI space. She founded the Equality Group, which is a tech-enabled equality, diversity, and inclusion consultancy. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, we also have Gibran Regist Charles here, who is a CEO and founder of Urban Edge Capital. And um, Gibran has uh, experience with the big legacy names in investment, sort of all the big names, Rothschilds, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. So I think you can say that he's well and truly immersed <laughs> in the investment community, but also a diversity um, expert in terms of investment. And then we have Puna Mehta, who is a corporate lawyer with over 10 years experience working with multinationals and in the city. And also, um, Puna, your other experience is that you're a governor for a primary school in Hackney. That's right. So thank you so much for um, joining us. And it's like quite a breadth of experience. So we'll try to get across as many of the specialist areas as we can, and I wanted to um, start with you actually, Poonam, and ask you, you know, what is diversity? Because diversity means different things depending on where you sit in the world. Um, and what does it mean to be data-driven? Um, just before I begin, I've got a brief disclaimer. I'm here in my personal capacity, and my views aren't representative of my current employer or any organizations <laughs> I'm affiliated with. Um, just, yeah, being loyally about it. Um, there isn't actually a concrete legal definition for diversity, but I think in an employment and organizational context, it's about representing the different people that make up our society and ensuring that they, they belong and they're promoted. And I think you can broadly put that into three buckets um, if you're looking at gender, um, ethnicity, and socioeconomic background, but of course, Diversity is very broad. You've got the LGBT community, neurodiversity, age, um, the list can go on. I think diversity is also nuanced. Um, and so it's not about you know just ticking a box and saying some, we've, we've got one black person, one Asian person, and one female in, in our organization. And I think that data can help us flesh out this nuance um, in a way that we haven't been able to do so before. 
Um, and that could help us move towards a goalpost of where there's true equality of opportunity and advancement based on merit. And from a legal perspective, um, I think one of the things that, one of the issues that I ran up against quite quickly in my role is that with a community that's dispersed across the world, that we have very different regulatory environments that I'm having to work with. So even from the point of disclosure, it's not as simple as um, I initially thought. Um, there are questions that can be asked in some countries and absolutely can't in others. Um, also, you have the issue of, as I said, diversity is dependent on where you are in the world. So if I'm trying to assess the diversity of, for example, my Tokyo Bureau, I have to use a very different set of assumptions than I would for New York or London. So if you're a multinational organization, what are the sort of regulatory hurdles that you might be facing? And are there strategies for sort of overcoming them and trying to bring some cohesion to the information that you're able to gather from your workforce? Um, that's a very good question. And the quick answer to that is, is no. <laughs> You'd have to take it on a country by country basis, yeah. I'm afraid. And, um, and that's something which big organizations grapple with all the time when any new regulation comes into place. And particularly in the ESG space, regulation is emerging um, at such speed and with a lot of variation that it's very difficult to keep track of it. It is. So given that, Hepsi, I'd like to come to you and ask you. So given these, these obstacles that organizations are facing, or challenges, I guess, that organizations face in gathering data and disclosing data, what does greater transparency and accountability look like for a large employer? Um, I'm going to come to that. I just want to pick up on the, lang the diversity sure. definition piece because I think it's really important. And I think diversity means many different things to different people. And certainly when we go in and work with organisations, a lot of the time we're stuck at gender diversity, mm. which is really frustrating because it's obviously very important but it's very one-dimensional and there are many other factors around demographic diversity that are really important and yet not being looked at, not being included fully in a definition and that therefore means that they are they're not coming through in the data because the data is only as good as the questions, the language that you're using to get to the underlying numbers. And particularly in this space, because most of the data is derived from questions being asked through surveys of people, so a sort of social listening tools that are distributed amongst organisations. And if you're only asking about a few types of diversity, not the full picture, and then you're not looking at the analysis of those overlapping layers of identity, then you're not really going to fully understand what it means to your workforce and the potential opportunities that that creates. So I think diversity definitions are very limited still. More limited than they, they need to be, but I, that's, that's something I think we can all be working on. Um, because we have, there's a lot of invisible diversity. That's, that's part of the, the challenge with this as well. So what does transparency and accountability look like? Um, well, certainly um, you know, disclosing as much data as, as you have, and we are seeing more of that, but we're not seeing as much, certainly for, if you're a, a champion of this topic, as you would hope to be seeing, such as the rollback on the ethnicity pay gap. Um, from the UK government and very few other governments around the world, even following on, say, the gender pay gap reporting. We really haven't seen that penetrating societies around the world as much as you would expect to. So there's a long way to go on disclosure. And my fear at the moment is because there's an awareness that there's regulation coming, is that people just sort of wait for the regulation rather than think about what are we actually wanting to create? What are we wanting to understand? What do we want our workplace to be like? What do we want our society to be like? Not waiting to be told what is the baseline minimum requirement, which is ultimately sort of where the regulation is going to end up. Mm -hmm. So there's a lack of ambition at the moment, um, which, as you can tell, I'm finding quite frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with that, but I think just with my corporate hat on, yeah. um, it's, it's because companies tend to prioritize revenue and then preventing immediate risks. 
Um, so even though they want to be seen to do the right thing, unless they're compelled to do so, there's a, there's a concrete reason to do so, it's very difficult to get everybody there. So I think that's probably one of the reasons behind it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's right. There's a lot of downside risk management focus just yeah. in the wider economy and society at the moment. We have a cost of living crisis. These are very challenging times. So thinking about what's the long-term potential, what's mm -hmm. the opportunity, what's the growth, what's the innovation that a more diverse workforce could bring, those questions aren't being asked. No, they're low on the priority yeah. list. Yeah. But, I mean, I can go on and I know that Veronica, you've no, got... No, no, <laughs> I was just saying, but, but there is still quite a lot of institutional framing around diversity, yeah. which I think is is interesting. I think that definitely the question of risk aversion in large companies and how that plays out on the ground is something we can come back to in this discussion. But I think it's a quite a large topic mm -hmm. in itself. Um, but to bring Gibran in now, um, one thing I guess, one good thing about compulsion, I guess, is it may bring some uniformity to some of the data that's released. And as an investor that tries to sort of play on the ESG and um, diversity data. I, will this would that help you, Gibran? I mean, at the moment, what does investing in ESG and allocating assets towards ESG? What does that mean? Um, unfortunately, we've got a bit of an ESG hangover. I mean, the point is that you know it was the last sort of twenty-four months was a big boom. ESG in terms of the market, where you know the world I live in is in terms of allocation money going into ESG as a cash cow, because it's a massive business, is set to top 50 trillion by 2025, right? It's a big, big, big market. The problem is the data is not uniformed. It's not formatted. There's no, it's very poor. So, and that's because there's no uniformity. The, the problem is that companies need to disclose <coughs> their accounts, their data, their DNI and their, and their ESG programming to the marketplace. But because no one wants to be first, you have this kind of, well, I won't do it because I get it wrong. So you've got this stagnant kind of pool where the, and the people who are taking advantage of this are the vendors, the ESG vendors who are out there posting numbers and saying, well, this year, Gap's on the best ESG company in the world or Tesla's going to be the ESG company in the world. Um, they're the ones, and that is inconsistent as well. So what that means, you've got inconsistent data, you've got poor data, the quality is really bad, so investors are going, well, do you know what, this ESG thing is great, but we're not going to invest it just yet. We're just going to pull back. And again, if you are a big company like BlackRock or you're, you're post 100 mil, then you can afford to be in, in ESG. But if you're sub 100 and you're an emerging manager like most guys are in the in industry, you can't really play in that sandbox because the data is not good enough or you can't afford to get that data because it's really expensive. So. It's, 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 it's great outside of the financial services community, um, but in the financial services community, it's still very, very treacherous. I was just going to add also, just from an ESG regulatory perspective, um, a lot of the regulations are focused on financial institutions with a certain turnover. Um, and so I think smaller yeah. companies are just not really considered in the same way yet. It's, I don't know if that's going to trickle down in due course, but... You can only get, I mean, you can get real, if it's over 100 staff or 1,000 staff, really, and you've got a, over a sort of 50 million turnover, you can get good data and it's, and it's out there because they're publishing. But sub that, it's really, it's really difficult to do that. It's really difficult to, to manipulate. And also, some of the big guys, if you're quite unique and you've got a specific, like what we started to do is we started off as a DNI hedge fund taking DNI out of HR, and making it very much about the social and looking at companies with good DNI data, like you know uh, Maersk and some of the big companies in the states. But the data we needed to actually implement our trades was just so poor that we couldn't consistently do that. Therefore, we couldn't get the money we needed to do it. So we had to completely change track, which is a shame. And that's why the big guys helped us do it. So, but also what's funny is that DNI is really good for business as a whole, and I think the companies that are trading it need to understand themselves and have DNI within their organisation. Yeah. So I think that's really a bit of a there's a bit of hypocrisy sometimes going on there in terms of. There is, but I think that you know we're at, we're at a time now with ESG as a whole where there's a lot of scrutiny and a lot of interrogation of ESG data across the board from environment and the issues that we're seeing around claims. Um, counterclaims of um, greenwashing, you know, all the way to interrogating governance 
um, structures within organizations and companies um, that are seeking investment. So I think that we can only expect um, higher demands around diversity data and the integrity of diversity data. Now you'd think that if there's a clear business opportunity here and an opportunity to make money, why, why is nobody stepping up? Why is nobody stepping into this space with a solution? Where are the AI guys? Where are all the tech wizards? Well, the, what's, well, so what's happened is the greenwashers came in, all the pirates came in and they cleaned out the market. So <laughs> the idea of having a really fancy website, because everyone's genetic, you know, I, we all start off going, well, it's a really good idea, we're going to be really honest about this because we love it and we can make money out of this and this is really good. And then the sort of sharks and pirates came and said, look, if I do a fancy website and, you know, go to the invest and say that we're at ESG, I mean, I wrote an article on LinkedIn that went viral about how to prove the ESG and stop these investors from getting robbed because there was no connection to ESG at all. And I think, you know, a few companies, including Goldman Sachs, got, 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 got penalised recently for claiming to be ESG but not actually proving it. And there's not enough punishment on those who are greenwashers. That's why, you know, I think that's where the issue is. But I think the greenwashers came in and that's why investors are a little bit sceptical now about what the, how they play the ESG game. Or, because, you know, ESG is a market for the, what, those who've got really good ideas and those who are really genuine about it and can innovate change need to be invested. They need to have that money to get the innovation through. And I think that's where the problem is with the greenwashers. Yeah. But you wonder with this whole data deficit issue, why the tech guys aren't coming in and offering solutions around how we collect data um, and making that easier? Because, for example, I was introduced in my new role to our HR systems. And one of the things that I wanted to do was try to include in our questions around people disclosing their demographic data. I wanted to do something to try to look at the type of socio-economic diversity that there is within our newsroom, if there's any. Um, the government has very good advice on how you might go about doing this, and I think it's about 15 questions. The HR system, I was told, can take two. No more. That's it. Um, I found it unbelievable that we don't have an HR system solution that can cope with what's a very current and widely talked about issue. Um, so I was very surprised, because I was told that oh, we definitely had the sort of market leader providing the HR systems that play in my organization and two of them, the limit on the amount of additional questions we could put in, which I just thought was absolutely crazy. Um, and then when it came to interpreting the data as well, I was quite surprised because, because we were restricted to two, we had to choose two from 15 questions the government had suggested. And it was really interesting, the different views on which two questions best, are best for ascertaining somebody's socioeconomic background. Um, and I felt that within people's arguments, a lot of biases were revealed. A lot of people were very stuck on whether or not you'd gone to an independent or private school. Some people felt that free school meals was sort of the cleanest data point. Um, other people argued for who was the main income bringer when you were 14. So this is from a list of questions that are um, suggested from the government. And that quite quickly highlighted to me that it's not just about collecting data, it's about interpreting data and how you remove human and social biases from that, from that data so that we get the sort of cleanest data points yeah. we can. Is that possible is one of my questions. Can I comment on that? Because we do a lot of survey data gathering for companies and look at obviously the social mobility, socioeconomic yeah. point um, and have to work with deeply embedded HR systems that, yeah. that are not set up to really fully capture the breadth of DEI, of which there are multiple mm. questions that sit beneath yeah. those letters. Um, and it, it costs a lot of money. That's actually the, the reason. It's not that I, I think you, I'm not going to mention the one, but you did tell me. 
I know companies that have had to add additional questions, but you have to pay a lot more money right. to do it, and therefore there's a value attached to that, and how much do you value yeah. that data? And right now, we don't value this data enough. Right. This, right. this data is not being funded because it is not deemed valuable enough. But how do you demonstrate the value if you don't have the data? And this is a catch-22 that we're in at the moment. Um, on the socioeconomic piece, if anyone is interested in that, I mean, the Social Mobility Commission um, Foundation is brilliant and has done extensive amounts of research on this and do publish the top one question. If you can only ask one, it's the um, profession of your parents at the age of 14. I mean, it's yeah. very, very specific. And then they have a series of other yeah. questions you can ask. So sometimes I feel like when we're getting into debates internally because everyone has a view and some people hate yeah. private schools and some people yeah. love them. Yeah. And, but this, there's a lot of science behind this topic yes. that actually if you refer to, it's very helpful to circulate and educate. There's a lot of education that's required yeah. on this topic to get to actually what is scientifically verifiable and that therefore should be used, as well as what is culturally allowed or accepted. Yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's a lot of cultural communicational yeah. nuances around this. So it, we found when we went, we were working here a lot in the UK, and then we were working with um, companies that had offices all over Europe and the world. But when we were going to places like France or Germany, actually asking about ethnicity was deeply problematic. In fact, outright rejected. Um, and so you know, we really needed to spend time on that. Why is this such an issue? Well, we, of course, because of history, and of course, because of the evolution of society post the Second World War. But but we need to be honest about what's happening in these societies today. Ghettoization is a very real thing. Racism is a very real thing. There are lived experiences of it when you go and ask your workforce. So yeah. but that's a long process to get leadership or whoever's spearheading these projects to be sort of brave enough and equipped enough to do that work. Um, and for example, the, the word inclusion. Inclusion, people sort of get here. I mean, again, everyone has different def definitions of it. In Germany, that means disability. It just means disability. So when you're saying, oh, do you want to ask about belonging or how effective the feedback is, it's irrelevant. You can't, you can't use that word. What do you think about law being a bit of a tool to help gather data? Because that law, law, law being used as yeah. a tool to help gather data? And um, I think it's, I think it's a, a helpful tool, um, but not, not the only tool. Mm -hmm. And I also think at the moment, law is being used as an excuse not to gather data as well as being used to help gather data. So uh, the fact that there is some level of restriction mm -hmm. around how you do it is then deemed too difficult yeah. to do. I'm just thinking in the context of, so gender pay gap reporting is, yeah. is mandatory. And it came yeah. into law in 2017. Mm -hmm. And since then, we have seen a year-on-year -year increase in, well, narrowing the gender pay gap in certain sectors anyway. And I'm, I suppose it's well, I mean, overall, it hasn't. Yeah. It's, it's got worse, hasn't it? It's, it was 11.9 well, in 2018, and it's, it's it went It went up from 7 point, point something yeah. to 9 point two or 4, and then yeah. I think there was a dip. But in yeah. certain sectors, it's, yes, it's shown yeah. to have yeah. made an improvement. Of course, there is a counter-argument mm -hmm. that perhaps yes. it was going to head in that direction anyway. Um, yeah, I but, mean, yeah. In, and also, just looking at from a finance perspective, I've, uh, asset, asset managers have to prepare implementation statements for, for, some, for, for their pension schemes that, where they provide delegated solutions, and they sort of set out specific ESG metrics, and d &I is one of the metrics now. Um, and the way to sort of quantify that, well, the only way to quantify that is gender pay gap. Or if you are a listed company, um, representation on the board because these have actually been well th there's there's legislation around yeah. them um, so I, I just wonder that if there was more effective regulation around mm. diversity mm. would that help with the, the the data gap that we currently Can have I just bring Jim yeah. Brand in here what is it that you're waiting for the Jim Brand what do you think is going to solve this problem is it technology is it the law I think because okay so my 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 job is managing risk. That's what I do. And, and I've, I'm, I've got a very selfish point of view here. So uh, what it is, is that everybody's, they don't want to be first. So because it's, it's, it's you know, the primary advice. It's the first person that does it and gets it right, we'll follow. Who gets it wrong, we'll go, that's a mistake. And we'll, and we'll, we'll mock and avoid them. So I think it's, it's, you know, I think, so 2020, after the, the George Floyd thing happened, you know, I mentioned that this other day, you had this massive, um, um, Massive guilt of between corporate absolution, I call it from you know mm -hmm. this need to go.
Goldman Sachs apologised with poor, you know, recruitment policies, and whatever, and they made all these pledges to, to increase, you know, uh, gender and ethnicity in the workforce, and whatever, and also massive charters, and that was going to come over the level, um, begin its sort of uh, crusade over the next five years, and it's still not been done yet because, you know, we, I, I look, you know, from my point of view, it's about making money. Is this going to make money or not, basically? So we have to take the politics out of it. We, got, we can't do the, the social feel-good issue, because that's, that's not my business. Um, my business is, OK, ESG is great, but you know, in five years' time, it might be dead and maybe something else. Okay? Right now, it's flooded with, with people in, you know, going to the market. It's making money. But, but is there initiatives that, is it going to make my company a better company? And I can say that as an employee, as someone who employs staff and has a business, I know for myself that DNI and ESG is good for my business on the social scale. So I do that. I look at it from that point of view in terms of my staff and how my company's going to make money in the long term. But then my clients and looking at some of the managers I look at, they've got a very different point of view. And it's about, well, really, I don't care. If it, 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 it's, it's a number on the screen. If it makes money, then great. If not, it doesn't. But they're completely oblivious to the social aspect to it and unfortunately that, that's what I try and educate I'm trying to educate the idea that I actually need to care about the fact that this is a long term yeah. but it's not going to go away, it's not a fad you know, ESG is really part of the, 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 the makeup of society over the next 10, 20 years, it won't be ESG in the next 10 years, it'll be called something else it'll just be how we open a business what we have is the fact that the data is so bad, everyone's scared to be the prime mover, that we're just waiting all the big banks are waiting on their hands and they're not filling in the, the, the required forms just yet. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, um, I think some of the accounting numbers came out recently, some of the reports we did. Netflix did a report about DNI, and i and then Coca-Cola did it. All the big companies that are, bo are bold enough to do it, you'll see a suit of them disclosing figures after. But then, you, then it's kind of waiting game again for something else. So, because it's voluntary. Well, and, and so it's, it's entirely reliant no, on sort yeah. of a game theory. There's no, there's no like, urgency, yeah. yeah there's, exactly. no, there's, there's no consequence. And the thing is, it's does it hurt your pocket? That's right. If it's not in my pocket, I don't care. That's right. Mm. So it can go forever. If, it's, if, it, if it means that I'll lose money, then I'll start to pay more attention to it. And that's the, that's the reason why ESG has become a thing. And or what I've noticed, DNI was a thing in my area. Was the fact that when I put a pound sign to diverse inclusion, everybody took notice. Yeah. Because yeah. it wasn't, uh, you know, before after lunch where you go for an hour election and you fall asleep and it's like, oh, it's HR. It's like, oh, you can make money out of this. How does it work? Then I got attention around that, and then I, I was able to capitalise that and make it an asset class and trade off it because then it was, then it became important. So everyone wants to know how they can make money off this new thing. It's been for ages, but now it's not a HR thing. It's actually well, actually, this this DNI you know, is a real thing. It's it's people and it's human capital. We do it for ages, but I think that's where the crux is. If you can make it a punish, if you can punish people, companies by financially not um, you know, submitting the data fast enough, then you're going to get a, a massive reaction. But you can, you can say that there's a monetary value to having diversity within your organisation and you can make the argument but if you can't demonstrate it in numbers, well, this, is this a sustainable argument? Because I told you my little secret earlier, yeah, which well. is that I am sceptical of the off-repeated well, off claim so, that diversity makes companies more profitable. So we, we work with Columbia University, uh, and we, we, we use their research grads, and we've got 95 research grads. So we were able to backtest hundreds of different strategies. and. You know, when we, as I said, when we first did this idea of, of going, right, we're going to do a single strategy where we're going to invest in companies that got great DNI. Out of that, we found five companies, right, who were great. Merck's and a few others in the state. Massive, you know, billion dollar companies. And, but the rest of the data wasn't there. And it wasn't sustainable. So we struggled for like nearly, nearly two and a half years trying to get the data, trying to, you know, almost sort of blue peter the strategy together to try and make it work. And it just, it just kept falling over. And it didn't work because there was not enough data to sustain it. And again, you know, you're competing against the likes of BlackRock, Goldman's, JP, and all these other, you know, millennials. But how did that portfolio perform of your it, 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 handful? It, it didn't perform. <laughs> we, sort of, we sort of had to sort of slowly bury it. <laughs> because it was just, it was just, because, because B&I is great, but it's not a, the, the, it, it's not enough yeah. 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 to sustain a, a hedge fund that eats data by the gallon, and it needs yeah. that kind of, so, I mean, then we, we went from a fundamental analysis shop to a quant shop where we, we start using the algos because that's the only way we're going to survive. So we started using the algos to be able to trade 
with the NI, and we, we start using some numbers and looking at different metrics and data points to, to say, well, okay, we'll, we'll do it that way. And you know, we become a multi-strategy now. So um, what, we, what we've decided and what the data shows is that ESG is a great enabler and modifier. It won't make you, won't make you rich, but it won't lose you money. Um, if you look at most investors and say, look, I've got an ESG fund, they don't really care. Like, I'm making 8% a year, great. Whether that be in China, doing mining or whatever, they don't really, or Raytheon, whatever, yeah, they're not really yeah. bothered. But I think the younger generation now do care about it. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the idea of companies taking responsibility about what they do. And this is where the social and ethical piece actually mm -hmm. is very important because if we have a generation, I do hope and think we do, yeah, yeah. that does care about this and is prioritising that and does want money to flow into things that are fundamentally good for people, good for the climate and good for society and the cohesion mm. of society as a whole, then we will no, see those, we, those benefits I, I over time. I, 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 I'm skeptical. Not, I'm skeptical yeah. Because I think um, there's, there's a lot of window dressing around ESG. And, and diversity in general. And um, the, the millennials and Gen Z have good intentions and they want to influence, they want to work for organizations that are at the forefront of ESG, but what happens at the leadership table? What happens at the board level? Mm -hmm. You know, that the company, a company's direction mm -hmm. is steered from the top. And, and if they don't really care so much about DNI in terms of the actual data, if they don't have the data in order to make informed decisions, then you're not going to have the impact yeah. you need. And I think this goes back to my question to you, Hepsi, is like, how do you get better data? And, and can, I, I agree, I think AI and technology definitely should be a tool, but I don't think it can be a tool unless there is some robust regulation in place in order to fac facilitate that. Because even if you are using AI, to analyze data, that presents new risks. Exactly, exactly. So, and we must remember that AI in itself is learning from past biases. Yeah. I mean, anyway, so. I want to pick up from you, you made earlier. I think I th the reason why we've become slightly more successful and a bit more popular is because of the fact there was a black guy doing a hedge fund, okay? Which meant that it opened different advantages that most of my cohorts don't have, yeah. okay? So that meant, I'm able to go and speak as a role model to other communities that don't see black head from marriage. You don't see them, they don't really. In America, yes, over here, not so much. In Europe, definitely zero. But what that meant for us and our students at Columbia was that they saw me and go, oh, he looks like me. He's doing something I can do. So there's a definite interest there. So I got this kind of following of kids and women and minority kids and from all backgrounds. I go, look, that, that, it can be done because it's very elitist. Like hedge funds is kind of the, the formula of, of banking to some degree. So I think the, the role model aspect, the sort of social aspect, the idea of being an example to kids was really important. And I think that's where, where, how we're able to get a lot of kids at university to kind of work for us in the end and have the champion this cause about, right, let's find if, DNA, if, if, if ESG, DNI thing really works. And they're working round the clock to sort of prove it because it's kind of become a bit of a personal point now, you know? Can I come back to Poonam on the point about getting... I, I do agree with you about leading from the top and that it has to come from there and that regulation will help to support that. But I do think we've seen cases where that grassroots level of employee pressure to actually disclose more. Um, like Penguin is a good case. A couple of years ago, they've been doing the gender pay gap reporting for four years at that point. And it was their employee base that said, this isn't by no means enough. We, and also we don't just have one identity here of our gender. Um, we want you to do more. And they brought in four other dimensions. But that came from a sort of petition within the organization. So I do think change can happen, grassroots and ideally Definitely. it meets from multiple yeah. stakeholder groups. Yeah. No. Um, and then they published it and they published almost the process of that development that you know they've responded and they're really excited to now see what this analysis shows. And it opened up, obviously for Penguin, this is a very clear business case of then authors that they were then able to identify, to speak to new communities, to think about what literature they wanted to see, to think about what characters they wanted to read and understand. So it sort of brought in a bit of a sea change to the culture yeah. as well. I mean, that's amazing to hear, and I wish there were many, many I mean, examples me like too. that. But often, <laughs> yeah. often it ends up 
in, in my experience, ends up being a HR issue mm. and something that HR is driving forward yeah. without necessarily yeah. support yeah. needed at, at the top. And this becomes more of a complex problem the bigger the organisation is and the more stakeholders there are. Yeah. I think, and to return to something I promised we'd return to, risk aversion within companies. Um, I think quite often I hear people talking about um, DNI executives and DNI strategies within organisations needing to be empowered by people at the very top. Um, the experience that I've had <laughs> is that you are empowered or I am empowered by the very top. What what is holding back some of the initiatives that we would like to start is actually more process mm -hmm. issues. So um, collating data. Um, I found that you will run up against um, various people within the organisation who will immediately start to warn you about the dangers of collecting any type of data and the um, potential risks it puts the company at, no matter what purpose you're gathering this data um, for people. We've had the same problem within the newsroom, for example, for trying to database our contacts. It was a huge concern in the business that this somehow was going to make us liable to all sorts of um, actions from people or demands from people to know everything that we keep yep. um, about them. Mm -hmm. And so there's a general feeling, I, I think, around data within big organisations at the moment is that it's probably best to avoid collecting it unless, absolutely, unless it's considered absolutely business critical. How do we get past this? Yeah, I mean, I think, so there, there's, um, there's the legal position, and then there's just corporate culture and fear. Yeah. Um, I think the ethnicity pay gap reporting is an interesting case study for this, because it was essentially, um, so it was considered at the same time as gender pay gap reporting back in 2017. Um, wait, I think actually way back in 2010, so at the same time as the Equality Act, so gender pay gap reporting became law in 2017. And since then, it's been considered a few times, but the government earlier this year decided um, that it wasn't going to make it mandatory, but they published some voluntary guidance around it. And essentially the main reason for it was because it was considered to be too complex um, and around the data point. So there was, well, how do you categorize data? Do you have a binary approach, i.e. all white people versus all ethnic minorities, which is just crude and unhelpful, um, or do you have a more granular approach? And um, the guidance identified 17 different ethnic groups, um, but also recognized it was only the larger companies that could even attempt to categorize you know, mm -hmm. data in that way. Um, I think it equates to like 171 mean and medium pay gaps if you were going to do it like that. Um, and so they said, well, okay, then you can just categorize it into five broad categories, black, white, Asian, mixed, other. But then you come back to the same argument. Well, then it's not nuanced enough. Yeah. And is the data useful? Yeah. Um, and then there was an argument, well, most people have fear around it. They don't want to disclose their ethnicity. So you're going to have incomplete data. Um, and, and then the GDPR and data protection. Um, so even though ethnicity pay gap is not mandatory, you can still overcome some of the GDPR hurdles. Um, I don't want to bore everyone with the law, but there's, there's Article 6 and there's Article 9, and there's a, essentially legitimate interest, so the organization needs to show that um, on balance it has a legitimate interest to process that data. Um, and there's also Article 9 being a public interest, um, substantial public interest uh, argument. And in this case, in the GDPR, there's actually was the Data Protection Act, there's actually a section on identifying and reviewing data for the purposes of um, equality of opportunity. So mm -hmm. it, they can do it from a GDPR perspective. The difficulty is what if you're a small organization yeah. and um, you've got, I don't know, 50 employees out of which there are four people from an ethnic yeah. minority background, well, they're easily going to be identifiable. Um, so yes, data is a big hurdle. I, I think that maybe, Hefsi, this is where some of the work that you do mm -hmm. could come into play. It's about communication and getting everyone on the journey and making them understand what the ultimate purpose of the exercise is, which is to use data for the public interest. And now we, you know, our data is everywhere. 
we're, we're giving it for all sorts of things and I actually get tired surfing the internet and the amount of like you know essential um, cookies yeah. and accepting all of that that you have to do so if people understand that their data is being used for the social good perhaps more people will come on board and that might dispel some of the fear organizations have of course you can't protect an organization completely from mm -hmm. say discrimination claims and the inevitable information that might come up as a result of say pay gap data yeah. um, which I think companies are probably quite you know risk averse about yeah yeah, I, I do think it comes down to um, a lack of vision and a lack of ambition and a, a, the culture of fear and not wanting to be sort of the one that puts the head above the parapet and also not necessarily wanting to know what the data says um, because it will be probably pretty bad. Um, but at least then you know what you're dealing with and where you're starting from. Um, spoken to a number of companies that do know what their ethnicity pay gap is but would never want to report it yeah. um, and obviously there's no compulsory need mm -hmm. but I think it's it's such a missed opportunity it's yeah. it's yeah. such a missed opportunity to speak to more communities a broader audience to really harness all the talent and the innovation that sits within that mm -hmm. um, so it's understanding the benefits of doing it and appreciating the benefits will outweigh the risks mm -hmm. And we've still got quite a long way to, to go and on that. That's a really interesting point that you made, Hesse, about companies perhaps doing the work internally. Oh, there's a lot of not, secretive, secret yeah. squirreling mm. on DEI data going on. Yeah. yeah, because I think there's a lot of, in, in the ESG space broadly, yeah. um, you've got greenwashing, then you've got green hushing. Yeah. So companies actually, yeah, taking action, yes. but don't want to be talking about it because they don't want to necessarily be accountable. Mm. I would public. say that it's not yeah. all negative. So, for example, yeah. we have a lot of internal data yeah. that we would love to share. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's much better than everybody thinks, my friend. Yeah, but the too. numbers are too small. Oh. They're too small to disclose because people would be identifiable. Well, and, and we have a lot of lawyers and company oh. secretary and uh, head of data all telling us that we can't. Yeah. And I wonder yeah. how many other organisations are And have you asked positions? the wider organisation, would you like us to disclose this aggregated data? And they data? would say yes. Yes, but wouldn't comes, that be wonderful? It comes down to That's the people not, that are the gatekeepers. Yeah, the gatekeepers. And, yeah. you know, their job yeah. is to prevent us mm. from transgressing mm. legislation and mm. guidance. And that's what they're paid to do and that's what they do. Mm. And that's one of my frustrations mm. in this role is discovering that there are all of these sort of internal and regulatory barriers to mm. putting out um, your narrative. Mm. Um, and actually it, it leads to the suspic to suspicions, yeah. you know, within your workforce and outside yeah. that you're not disclosing because you've got an awful Because secret. they've given their data and they're, they're like, given their data. data. <laughs> to know they're yeah, like actually we're yeah. interested what yeah. does this look like exactly. it so also, this isn't a position i expected to be yeah. in it yeah. also depends on what environment you're in, what industry you're in. I mean, we, we, I, I'm horrified at giving that data because it's it's complete advantage. It's it's my it's my yeah. it's my uh, it's my gem. It's my god particle. I, you know, it's it's crucial for us to keep this data in a black box. You know, headphones are a black box for a reason because, you know, if we if we give away a strategy or we give out some information, that's why headphone websites are so vague. And they're so bland because you know any you know our competitors are very savvy at picking up data. I mean, you know, I work in the most skilled data environment on the planet. Some of the guys that we are are engineers who you know we've got guys who work for Facebook, Twitter, you know, Tesla have come. These guys are rocket science, literally rocket science. And hopefully some women as well. And some women have we asked from some women as well. Uh, Tina uh, is the next one. She's uh, she's a writing woman there. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's 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 uh, it's it's crucial that so it's different with right me. It's it's you know if you're it's for, in finance, it's, it's you don't give it away because it's your advantage. It's how you make money again, you know, it, and and it's just the amount we consume. You know, some firms do what's called high frequency trading, where they trade millions of shares a second, basically, yeah. and they need vast communications and data to do that as well. So it depends on the environment. So. We, we want you to give away data because we'll just collect it. <laughs> and we'll know, but we won't give ours away. Just, yeah. just to give around, just to probe that a little bit further. So what commercial disadvantage would you have if, say, you published on your website 
pay gap information or, I don't know, di diverse representation on your board, for example? It's not, I mean, I, it's ha we're happy to do it. It's not a, a, I think we started doing that in the beginning, but what happens is you find yourself in a culture fit, right? And I think culture is really important. I think we have to, we're bold enough to be just a little bit outside of the narrative of, of, of the most of the, of the funds that exist because they're very much kind of, you know, down the middle, straight, boring sort of cohorts. And we're edgy because we are very much about a diversity to what we do and the ESG tilt what we do. So we can put out a little bit more. I mean, we do it more in terms of a report or a white paper we publish. We do it on a, not on the website, but we do a report about what we found about it. So we do lots of, you know, medium posts. We do lots of um, LinkedIn posts as well, which we get a lot of feedback from. Um, I think it's, it's just because you, we're not allowed also, because we're governed by the FCA, to give out any financial or strategy information or anything like that in terms of our promises that we can do. We just literally print the facts and say, well, this is what we found on X, Y, and Z. But I think, again, when you've got a business, and we're quite a small team, so we don't have that breadth of, 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 I mean, everyone on our team gets paid pretty much equally, really, so there's not that much diversity in, in the pay scale as it is. But I don't think it's a disadvantage. I think it's, again, very I, much what- Well, I can tell you one disadvantage. <laughs> Organisations aren't just competing for clients and customers, it's, they're also competing for employees. And yeah. I think um, that's one area where you can become very exposed by disclosing. Especially in the environment we've been in for the past couple of years in media, where many of the very big media names have made it very explicit that they want to improve representation of particular groups, particular visible minority groups. And so immediately you had a very hot market for particular there's, there's, demographics. The, the market for talent at the minute the market is, for talent is huge exactly. at the minute, yeah. So, but what I would like to do is to sort of open this up so we can hear some broader experiences, um, if possible. So, sorry, I think the lady with the orange top had um, come up with the first, but I will remember the other. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really good discussion. Um, putting aside the legal, regulatory and commercial limitations associated with collecting and collating data, if we move on to the other potential limitations, so for example, trust and establishing the trust of your workforce and encouraging people to self-identify, particularly when you're dealing with members of communities where trust has been broken time and time again by authority figures and corporations. Um, I'd be keen to hear the panelists' views on that. The other aspect is um, the appropriateness of the categories that we ask people to identify with. Um, do they accurately reflect the complexities associated with cultural identity? Normally we go by the census yeah. categories. It's not necessarily the right way to do it. How do corporations go about being brave enough to change that and then use the data in a meaningful way? Yeah, it's a great, a great question. Um, yeah, the trust building exercises are a really critical one to spend time on up front um, and spend more time on than just tweaking what is the data that we want to get. Actually, what is our, where is our organisation at right now on this topic? How much do we understand and appreciate and know? What have we been doing to date? Why are we even doing this? Are, are we doing this because we want to be seen to be doing this? Are we doing it because... Uh, you know, NAD on the board has said we've got to catch up, we've got to do it. It's got to have more meaning to the organisation and people have got to understand why they should be giving this data, How not only like legal, how's it going to be stored and kept, and but actually what are you going to do with it? What meaningfully am I going to see from giving you this data? Are you going to publish a pay gap report? Are you going to integrate this more into the business strategy? Are you going to be looking at how we can um, recruit in new communities? Yeah, what are you actually doing? So there needs to be a thoughtful strategy um, around this up front that is then communicated and, and taking time to have conversations um, whether that's in sort of larger groups or by a survey that it's actually sent out. So a few different forms of actually engaging on this topic. And also I really strongly suggest that it has a very senior, if not the senior leader, spearheading the exercise to say this really matters to our organisation and this is why and this is why we are going to be doing this process and it's how it's going to work. So it, that, that can take a while, but it's so worth doing. And then what you see 
the clear trust indicator really is around um, participation on the data. And that can vary from my experience, not working by any means with the majority of corporates, but you know, different sized businesses, anywhere from 40% to 90% plus. And we, at a quality group, we always target 80% plus. Um, but that's because we will make sure that this, the time is spent up front doing this work, the, the important work of the engagement, the communication and the culture building. And quickly on your point about um, data categorization and labeling, and, and the question was like, is that appropriate? Is the census, you know, what, what, what benchmarks do you use for this? Yes, um, really, you know, depends on the country and exactly which demographic groups you're wanting to spend time on. But I highly recommend looking at who are the experts in this space. So socioeconomic, go to the Social Mobility Commission. If you want to look at different areas of disability, go to those areas, go to those. And a lot is in the charity space. A lot of work has happened in the NGO and charity space. Like they have deep knowledge of the communities that they work with. Now, the governance of the charity space could be better, it's not very diverse, but that's a separate topic. And then the key thing is to ask for self-disclosure. So if you are not captured here, how would you yeah. like to be? Yeah. How, how do you see yourself? Just ask that. Ask it on every single question. Make sure there is always a space for people's self-disclosure and self-identification in their own words and their own language, and you end up learning a lot from that data set. Yeah, I think you've covered, covered most yeah. of it. Um, yeah, pretty comprehensive. Uh, yeah, very comprehensive. <laughs> I think uh, I think communication is key, and I agree on your point about um, senior leadership in an organisation sending that communication out. Yeah. Um, again, though, I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation because it's without the need to actually have data and greater clarity as to mm. what that data should look like. The exercise of communication becomes difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just a point on like how the grassroots championing can also work, which is we've been pulled in when things have got have gone wrong. You know, there's been a swathe of resignations um, from a certain group, and they're like, we didn't even know they had an issue. And it's like, well, then they've left. They've they've told you with their actions that they do not want to work here, and that there is a problem. And the exit interview body of knowledge builds up, and then finally something is done. Also, so there are there are organised. There's there quite a few companies yeah. that are voluntarily disclosing more information now. So yes. I suppose in terms of grassroots movements, yes. that's one way to influence is to mm. say so and so is disclosing and. Mm -hmm. that could help and always encourage people to do exit interviews they're yeah. often not done but they're so important oh sorry uh, um, my name is Raj is this working can you hear me I'll just pick up <laughs> thank you um, so first I'll start with an observation and then if I could ask a question at the end um, I, I, I get this idea that we've got to focus on the tone at the top, and, and I agree with that, but I think that's just the fundamental start. I think the reason that there's been so much failure in this area in large organizations and important organizations is because what I've described as the, the moldy cheese sandwich, you've got, you've, you've got a pretty good tone at the top, you've got millennials who care deeply about these issues and are pushing the agenda very, very heavily, and I think they, they deserve an awful lot of credit for a lot of the improvements that are actually being made in organizations. But right in the middle, you've got this moldy cheese. And what's happening with that is you've got a lot of, you've, you've got a lot of mainly men, they're mainly white, they are behaving in a way that is, that they're, they're really trying to get themselves promoted. They're behaving in a way that makes it very, very difficult for the juniors to progress and there's a real there's a performance metric that's really missing in these organizations and it's a different type of data that i don't think we've covered this evening and the focus for that that, that the middle of that sandwich is to make money going to your point and if they're making money in the short term they're rewarded but the problem is that they're not being measured on the sorts of things that actually matter in the longer term how are they treating their juniors? How, are they, how inclusive are they being with the diverse people that they actually have under them and they're trying to bring through? And so what you end up having is the, you, you, I've seen so many times you've got quite a lot of diversity at junior levels and then it disappears. And I think a big part of the reason for that is that moldy cheese in the middle and it, we're, not, we're not getting past that. 
and the performance metrics end up perpetuating the sorts of behaviors that result in success for those people to go into the senior positions. When they get to senior positions, they can start talking a good game again. But while they're hustling, the behaviors are poor. And the question I'd like to finish off with, if I may, is, um, I mean, it breaks my heart to hear that you are skeptical of this idea that diversity actually results in a profitable organization. And, and, I, and I'd, I'd love for you to, to elaborate on that so I understand that better. Yeah, so um, I think that I suspect that within that sort of mantra, there is a confusion between causation and correlation. I think that I can see clear cases where having more diverse um, set of employees could be a competitive advantage in the market, particularly um, companies that are um, consumer retail style companies. I feel like if you're Unilever and the only people in your organization making decisions are one demographic, you're not going to sell you know, soap across the world, right? I wonder when it comes to things where it's more sort of businesses that are more business to business, I wonder if it's true if the business is um, quite a technical service that's being offered. I wonder, for example, if that's true when it looks when you look at the um, legal industry. I wonder if it's true um, in certain areas of finance. Um, that's not to say I don't think diversity is a good thing to have, but I don't think that the argument always has to be about profit. And I think that. If your argument for diversity isn't thorough and isn't authentic and can't be demonstrated, I think there's a danger that it does more harm than good. And I actually feel that adopting some of these mantras may be contributing to the demise of the chief diversity officer, um, which is something that I find myself very heartbreaking to see because I feel like some of them have been set up to fail. Can I just follow up on one thing on that, and, that, and that's the, the, you talked about the legal industry, yeah. and that's, that's an industry that's close to my heart because I was a partner at the international law firm until recently, never tech founder, but still, the, what I saw was when we had no women partners mm -hmm. in, in the London office, the level, the, the type of discussion and the type of decision making that was going on in the room, it would just just not good enough. Mm. We got the first woman through the door, the quality just improved. Mm. Yeah. Right? Men started behaving differently in the room because there was a woman present. The mm -hmm. second woman came. The decision making got even better mm -hmm. and the behaviour of the men got even better. It just became more inclusive. Yeah. Just better just, just better behave. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so so I, 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 I fundamentally disagree with this idea because I feel it in practice. The behaviours change as soon as that diversity develops inside the room. I, can, I agree. can you demonstrate? Can you demonstrate the profitability of that? I mean, it's great. It's a it's a better working environment, a more creative working environment, a more comfortable working environment. But can you demonstrate? And I think if we make these types of claims, we have to understand the type of metrics that we need to deploy to prove. Twofold. These, these Twofold. Things. I can demonstrate it by two ways. First of all, recruitment cost out, mm -hmm. right? Because all of a sudden, we're actually, we we're able to attract the right talent and it, and it started to, to, to yeah. generate through the ranks. That's one, so the costs actually mm -hmm. fell. Mm -hmm. and, and that was demonstrable. And the, and the second was that our clients were demanding it. Our clients, yeah. on, the, on the revenue side, it's huge. You, know, you can't walk into a meeting with Goldman Sachs and say to them, you know, walk in with, with, with no women. Mm -hmm. with no, mm -hmm. no ethnic diversity. Mm -hmm. He just mm -hmm. looked like a fool. Mm -hmm. So you know they they were driving it, and we were listening. Mm -hmm. So for sure, it was absolutely demonstrable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Too. I think one quick way to demonstrate it is to have the data. Well. And we've got time for one more question. <laughs> oh goodness me! <laughs> there are so many hands. Um, <laughs> I'm really sorry. Sorry. Um, I recently came from the United States, although I am a British citizen, and um, the point of view that I have in, in the United States is that since um, 
George Floyd's murder in May of 2020, there has been a huge push. It is not enough, but it has been a huge push, and it has been pushed by the government, which started actually several years ago to sort of look and make sure that there are people from all walks of life, and they require that before universities and research centers can get federal grants, and that is a huge pot of money. Um, foundations now, big foundations like the Ford and the Mellon are requiring those um, statistics, and uh, a number of um, uh, stockholders are going before the, the boards of corporations like, you know, all the financial institutions and asking for um, data. Now, usually the kind of data that I've seen that people ask for is race, ethnicity, um, gender, and salaries because, they, you know, we're, at, we're facing a lot of uh, inequities and in, in salaries. So um, there's a lot of push and pull from a lot of different quarters. And in some institutions, and we have just hundreds of thousands of nonprofits in the United States, um, the, the director or the president or whoever is, uh, is evaluated on what I call IDEA, IDEA. Um, so it has become a huge, huge issue now. Now, it may not be good enough, and it was, I was fascinated that you said that there are 15 different categories that some institutions collect on. I, I've never seen that, but in the United States, we do have a census every 10 years, and they collect a, a group of information. But in, in corporations and universities and all, they are looking all the time. They're looking at boards. They're looking at, at committees. They're looking at advisors. It is, it's a new world. It may not be perfect, but it's a better world. <laughs> Thank you so much. Could I just beg this gentleman over here to have a chance? Because I've I yes. promised him many times. <laughs> But just a quick reflection on, on data and then on the company's drivers, really. Uh, in terms of, I, I'm a data protection expert, so I'm probably oh. one of your enemies, <laughs> one of your self frustration. Um, of why, why data is not good. Data is not good because it's, it's been told many times that you know, the, the, the type of people we want to empower, the type of people we want to lift up in companies are the ones that are least likely to want to share this type of data. And so, as soon as we make any data point optional, those people are the people we lose in the statistics. And so the data is going to be inherently skewed against those minorities of any types that we actually want to lift, um, lift up. And AI doesn't really help, I think, in this situation. So, you know, I'm actually quite grateful that it was not mentioned many times here because it's not a panacea here either. Yeah. The type of data it would find not only it would be inherently biased, but it would be subject to the same type of regulations that give you frustration right, right now. Mm -hmm. The second piece I wanted to say was just in terms of the drivers of companies, you know, um, maybe profit, maybe growth, but ultimately it's risk, right? So the, the management of risk, which could be regulatory, could be reputational, and, and, and so on and so forth. And so just saying that we, we should boost diversity because it's nice or, or because it's cute, to, to quote mm -hmm. a very mm -hmm. famous m movie, it, it doesn't work on the large scale. It may, it may work in certain, in certain fields, in certain special situations like my, my former company, but it doesn't necessarily work mm -hmm. everywhere. So we must understand what are the drivers of risk of those companies and work on those. And regulation is, of course, the, mm -hmm. the primary tool we do that as a society. It's not the only one. Mm -hmm. um, the, the example that, that you brought uh, is very similar to, for example, unionization. So, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the employee is actually demanding a better and, yeah. and, you know, equality and so on. So risk, I think, is what we yeah. need to use. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to say I agree. I think regulation, yeah. communication, and then AI. That's my good point. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're very good points, and I agree entirely, I think. Um, just a little note on AI because we've developed a DEI data scraping tool and have been testing different versions of AI on that data scraping as well as having lots of human eyes and intelligence looking at it. And um, there's still a, a long, long way to go. There's, there's a lot of false data <laughs> or just missing, just completely missing um, that 
that still needs to sort of be populated. And it's, um, it, it, it is obviously rapidly evolving and will be a helpful tool in the toolkit for data collection, but it will not solve it. That will come from us as humans caring about one another and wanting to know about one another and building companies and societies that actually respect each other. Yeah. That's where it will come from, always. I think if, as, if the data gets better, then AI will, could become a more, more effective useful. tool. Yeah. And um, Gibran, got a final word to say? Um, yeah, I'm just listening to it actually because it's obviously a different perspective. Um, so I live in a very close box, so it's, it's, it's interesting here and perhaps it's in your, in your view on, on the sort of thinking about how, how I perceive it. I mean, I agree with the gentleman over there about risk. I mean, um, for us, you know, I work in risk business. The data that, you know, again, we're driven by the idea, is this, is this valuable? Will it make money? Can I raise money on this, right? With the data, with the asset, or whatever the business case may be. Um, without an ESG policy, you won't, like, you won't get any money, right? So all companies have to get an ESG policy. That's the standard now. Most pension funds won't donate or allocate money without that. Um, in my business, I've seen how horrendous the ESG data is. And, you know, what I've seen, basically, over the last six months, ESG funds have lost money compared to the S&P because people are putting money out there because the data's so important, okay? The only people who are making money in the ESG field are the in this sort of cash cow are the vendors, the ones on the service on the outside who are marketing it, who are sort of selling it, they're or writing books about it, they're the ones that actually are kind of profit out of it really. Um, I think the way we solve it is is by having some sort of punishment for not disclosing or what's the risk. And, and again it boils down to it, if there's no financial risk to this, I don't need to care about it. And that's the same as the point you were making about the frozen middle, I call it, what do you call it? The moldy cheese moldy. middle, <laughs> the moldy sandwich. On, on the other part yeah. of it, though, I've, you know, all of my heads of departments are women, apart from Michael. So I know for a fact, and I've seen it in other businesses, I've worked at big businesses, that I know the fact that personally, women are exceptional. I mean, you disagree with it, but I do, I do believe that, Morgan, that report, the 2017 report about... Um, about women in compl complex systems, it's it's it is, and I worked in trader rooms of 500 people, and I know, as the gentleman said, you, you know, our heads of desk or a desk trader or a, a desk assistant for a female, they they quell the storm of you know 16 guys who are furious and smashing phones around. So there's something to be said about, that. And, and and I think depending on the system you work in, the environment you work in, diversity, especially if you're in ethics, ethnicity diversity, is very important. And I think. How do you prove that? Do you want to disclose that? I mean, it, it, I think it's important, but not enough people get to see how it is because not enough people are, you know, at the very top to oversee it. Most people are working in a in a middle management or an, uh, some sort of level where they don't get to sort of see the overview. I'm lucky enough to see the overview and see how it works. Um, I would publish it definitely in terms of a report, but it's not good. My you know, singing in the wind, really. I need other people to, to say how, how how good it is. But again, it's a very selfish point of view. You know, my job is for the welfare of my business and my staff and my stock and my stakeholders. So my biases are to, to generate whatever's necessary for them, really. And, and that's right. And also for, for, you know, taking on board my, you know, my, uh, my students who I love very dearly. They're, they, you know, they've shown me quite a bit because they're really smart and they, you know, they know how to use the data. They know how to manipulate it to get the best out of it. And also, you know, this code bias thing, which was a big problem, right? Code bias is massive because the people who quote AI are normally white males, right? So, you know, the, the idea of putting your hand on the thing and the mask, I don't know if you saw that. It's quite interesting. Um, so, you know, I think what we're doing over um, with ourselves and also with, with Columbia is getting a lot of these guys and girls into these, into these positions where they can actually have a voice and make a, and make a decision, get them on the front line, basically. Yeah. So many demands on people's time and so many other things people can be doing on a warm evening in London. So it's been, I really appreciate you guys coming along. Thank today. you very much. I just wanted much. to quickly say a brief call for action. Um, I mean, if you are interested in this area, do it's interrogate what's going on in your organisations and, and do influence. Um, because I do agree with you, Hepsi, grassroots mm -hmm. activism to some extent does make a difference. And then slowly, maybe the landscape will change. Um, in fact, I'm excited to see how the landscape changes over the next few years.
Thank you. No, but good idea. <laughs> yeah.